It's great to have our visitors. We welcome you to the Royal City Church of Christ as we assemble together on Sunday night to take another opportunity to worship God and to study from His Word. What we're doing on Sunday night here is we're going through the Old Testament and we're looking at every book of the Old Testament and we're seeing Christ in every book of the Old Testament as there are promises, prophecies, and predictions and foreshadowings of our Lord in every book of the Old Testament. We're looking at the book of Job tonight. The book of Job. As we look at the book of Job, we could be looking at the oldest book in the Bible. There are those who believe that Job predates the writings of Moses. The context of the book of Job is of a man who lived during the patriarchal period. And some believe the book may have been written not long after or perhaps even in the lifetime of the man named Job. So it could be the oldest book in the Bible, perhaps 4,000 years old. Perhaps the first book written by inspiration. It's a very powerful book as we see the content, contents of it. Job lived during the patriarchal period, as we have said before. As we look into the book, we, we find indications that show that Job was not living during the Mosaic period as far as living under the law of Moses. Let's look at four indications to see that. How do we know that he lived during the patriarchal period? Well, first of all, we read in Job 42 and verse 16 that he lived 140 years after the events in the book. We're not told how old Job was when the events of the book took place, but after those things happened, it says that Job lived 140 years. So it's possible that, and it, it's likely that he lived during the same time period as Abraham, some have even speculated whether he was a contemporary of Abraham or even lived before Abraham. He is living a long life. You find those long lives in the book of Genesis during the patriarchal period. Second indication. His wealth is measured in livestock. Job chapter 1 and verse 3. Wealth during the patriarchal period was measured in livestock. As we're studying the book of Genesis on Wednesday night, we see that. That's how a person's wealth was measured. And Job's wealth was measured in livestock, Job 1 and verse 3, and in Job 42 and verse 12. The third indicator is he acted as a priest for his family. Job chapter 1 and verse 5. He sacrificed for his family. During the patriarchal period, the patriarch of the family would sacrifice for the family. And therefore, you see Job, as we will get into Job chapter 1, we see that he did sacrifice for the family. And then fourthly, finally, no mention of the law of Moses in the book of Job. There's no mention of that, and there's no mention of circumcision. So those are indications to tell us that this book is talking about a man who lived during the period known as the patriarchal period before the law of Moses, perhaps a contemporary of Abraham, or even lived before Abraham. A brief outline of the book, Job chapters 1 and 2, Job's suffering begins. Job 3 through 37 you have a series of debates and discussion put in written form and poetic form or, or wisdom literature form over why he was suffering. His friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, and Elihu come to him and in essence ask him, what did you do? What did you do, Job, to have all this suffering come upon you? And in verses 38 through 42... You have God speaking to Job. And also Job being restored and blessed even more than he was 
at the beginning. So God finally breaks his silence in Job chapter 38 and speaks or God speaks to Job and and ask him a series of questions. You find that Job during this period of suffering says, I wish I could have an audience with God and ask him why. As we will see the suffering that he endured, he wanted to talk to God and ask him why. Well, God manifests his power and he appears to Job in a whirlwind. And then God asked Job some questions. He says, you want to ask me some questions? Let me ask you some questions. You find this in chapter 38. Where were you when I created the world? Where were you when I laid its foundation? Can you control the forces of nature? Can you control the stars? He asked him a series of questions over and over and over again about the natural natural world. And Job at the very end says, I, I can't say anything. I spoke of things that I have no knowledge of. And as a result of that, he humbles himself before Almighty God. It's very interesting as we see Job suffering, Job as a righteous man suffering, wanting an audience with God, God never tells Job why he's suffering. He never explains it to him. And the message that you get from the book of Job is this, God is worthy of our worship, our praise, our adoration, our submission, and our obedience because He is God. Whether we are abundantly blessed or whether we are suffering tremendously. That's the message that we get from the book of Job. Look at Job chapter 1. As we see the beginning of Job's suffering, we're introduced to the man Job. And we see what kind of person he is in verse 1. We don't know who wrote Job. Perhaps himself, perhaps someone Else it's not revealed to us. Job chapter 1 and verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz, not Oz, the man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless, upright, who feared God and shunned evil. So right off the bat, we are told what kind of character Job is. He lived in the land of Uz. There, people aren't too sure where that is. And he was a blameless individual. Some translations might say perfect. The old King James says perfect. That does not mean sinless. That means someone who is mature. We know from Romans 3.23 that all have sinned. But Job was a person who lived a life of righteousness. And if he had sin in his life, as we all do, it was very few and far between. He was blameless. And in verse 1, he was upright. That talks about his moral outstanding behavior. He lived an upright life before God. And he feared God. He respected God. And he turned away from evil. That goes hand in hand. If you fear God, you respect God, you're going to turn away from evil and you're going to do what's right. Look at verse 2, Job 1 and verse 2. The seven, he had seven sons. And three daughters that were born to him, verse 3. Also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camel, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. See, his wealth is measured in livestock. In the case that he lived during the patriarchal period. He was described in verse 3 as the greatest of all the people of the East. Verse 4. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day. Some believe that that's referring to a birthday. And would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. Verse 5, So it was, when the days of feasting had run their course, that Job would send and sanctify them. Notice, Job is acting as a patriarchal priest. And he would rise early, verse 5, in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus, Job did regularly. You see here that Job was a leader in his family and that he sacrificed in behalf of his family and he wanted his family to be right with God and therefore he sacrificed for them so they would be sanctified or set apart. Verse 6 
through the remainder of the chapter, you have something interesting. A lot about this we do not understand. Falls within the category category of Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord. But what we have revealed to us is verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The sons of God there refer to the angels. The angelic beings. They are the creation of God. And they presented themselves before Almighty God, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, verse 7, From where do you come? Now, please understand, God knew. God knows all things. Verse 7 says, So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and an upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? Look at Job. He is a person who fears me. He's blameless and he's upright and he turns away from evil. Have you considered him? Verse 9, So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Does he fear you for nothing? Verse 10, Have you not made a hedge around him and around his household and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions and have increased and he he has increased in the land. Verse 11. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will surely curse you to your face. Satan says to Almighty God, does he fear you for nothing? Look at you. Look at all the blessings you have given him. You have hedged him in. You have protected him. Of course he's going to serve you. Because you have blessed him abundantly. Take it all away. Take all those blessings away and he will curse you to your face. Verse 12. The Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. I want you to notice verse 12. And this is something that we need to understand. Satan can only do what God allows him to do. Satan is not all powerful. He is a limited being. And God says to him, what he has is in your power. I'm giving you permission to take away his blessings, but don't touch his life. Don't touch his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. The Lord is going to allow Satan to touch Job's blessings. Verses 13 through 22, you have Job attacking, you have God, or excuse me, you have Satan attacking Job's blessings. Look at verse 13. Now there was a day when the sons and the daughters were eating and drinking wine in the oldest brother's house. A messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing, the donkeys feeding beside them. Verse 15, when the Sabaeans raided them and took them away. Indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. That's bad. It's going to get worse. Verse 16, While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven. Perhaps a poetic way of talking about lightning. The fire of God came down from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. That's bad. It's going to get worse. Verse 17, while he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels, and took them away. Yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. That's terrible. But it's going to get even worse. Verse 18, While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house and it fell on the young people and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Job, you've lost all of your wealth and all of your children. You've lost everything. Verse 20, then Job arose, tore his robe, 
shaved his head, fell to the ground and worshipped. Here is how this righteous man reacts to all this news. Is he hurting inside? Yes, he's hurting. He tore his robe. That's an indication of sorrow. Shaving his head. Fell down in the ground. And he worshipped God. Verse 21, and he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He says, I came into this world with nothing. I'm going to leave this world with nothing. The Lord gave me blessings. And the Lord has taken them away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, verse 22, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Satan thought he could have him with that. But it didn't work. Job chapter 2. Job chapter 2, you see that Satan is going to try again. He's going to try to get Job once again. Job chapter 2 and verse 1, again, there, there was a day when the sons of God, the angels, came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Satan answered and said to him, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth in it. See, Satan is like a roaring lion, James tells us. He wants to destroy us. He's going forth in the earth and he wants to destroy us. Verse 3, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil, and still he holds fast his integrity, although you enticed me against him to destroy him without cause? There was no reason, because Job was a righteous man. He wasn't perfect. He wasn't sinless. Only one that was. That's Jesus Christ. But he was a man of outstanding character. He was godly. He feared God and wanted to do what's right. And and all of this came upon him. And God says, it is without cause. Verse 4. So Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bones and his flesh. And he will surely curse you to your face. You affect his physical well-being. You take away his health. And he'll turn on you. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. Again, Satan is limited in what he can do. He can only do what God allows him to do. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord, verse 7, and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. When you read throughout the book of Job, you see indications of what kind of disease this may have been. It was a painful disease that affected his whole being and as a result of that made him suffer tremendously. Verse 8, he took for himself a pot share, that's a broken piece of pottery, with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. Here's a man who was in the luxury of wealth in chapter 1. Now he's sitting among the ashes with a broken piece of pottery to scratch his boils. He's lost all of his wealth. He's lost all of his children. Now he's lost his health. Here's the advice that he has. Verse 9, his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. Now we need not be too hard on her. Because she's probably wanting him to be put out of his misery. But it was a foolish statement, and we know that because of verse 10. He said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speak. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? And all this Job did not sin with his lips. 
He said, we we receive blessings from the Lord. Should we not receive adversity? God gave all of these blessings to us. He has a right to take them away. He says, it is foolish what you are saying. As you read throughout the book of Job, you you see, starting in chapter 3, and we won't take the time to look at chapter 3, but you see Job wishing he'd never been born. Wishing that he had died as an unborn child, that he would have been stillborn. But it's very interesting as you read that throughout the book of Job, Job never considers taking his own life. He never considers suicide. He wished that he would die. He wished that he had never been born, but he never considers taking his own life because he knows that's God's prerogative. That's not for a man to do. As we see the suffering of Job, of course, his friends come to him. And, and as we said before, in essence, said to Job, what in the world did you do? You must have sinned tremendously for all of this to come upon you. And Job said, I haven't done anything. I haven't done anything. And remember what God said, that all that that came upon him, Job 2 and verse 3, was without cause. And it was putting Job to the test. In the midst of all of the suffering and and these things, Job wished that he could have someone represent him before God. He wished that he could have a representative. Look at Job chapter 9. Job chapter 9, verses 32 through 35. Job is speaking here. And he says, for he is not a man, talking about God. God is not a man as I am, that I may answer him, and that we should go to court together. Verse 33, nor is there any mediator between us who may lay his hand on us both. A mediator. So they could go to court together. Verse 34, let him take (coughs) it. Let him take his rod away from me. Do not let dread of him terrify me. Verse 35. Then I will speak and not fear him, but it is not so with me. Job is is talking and is suffering and pain. And he says, "There there is no one that will go with me, that we should go together to court a mediator between us. But we know from the New Testament, there is. We understand that there is a mediator. It's fully realized in Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, Paul tells Timothy, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. We realize something that Job could not have realized. That there is a mediator between us who may lay his hand on both of us to bring us together. And that's Jesus Christ, our great high priest. There is a mediator. Look at Job chapter 16. Job chapter 16, verses 19 through 21. Job says, Surely even now my witness is in heaven, and my evidence is on high. My friends scorn me, talking about his friends, who are trying to get him to fess up to what he did. That shows his suffering. Verse 20, my friends scorn me. My eyes pour out tears to God. Verse 21, oh that one might plead for a man with God as a man pleads for his neighbor. You see, he is longing for that mediator. He's longing for that person who would be an advocate for him. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, we learn from the Apostle John that we have an advocate. 1 John 2, 1 and 2. My little children, these things I write to you that you may not sin. Do not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate. We have that mediator. We have that one who would plead our case. With the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. 
Verse 2, He Himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. That word propitiation simply means that Christ's sacrifice on the cross satisfied God's righteous wrath against sin. He bore our sin in Himself on the cross and therefore became the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. And as a result of that, He ascended back to heaven after His resurrection. And now, He is our high priest. He is our mediator. He is our advocate to plead our case with God. Job chapter 19. Job chapter 19, verses 23 through 27. This may be the first recorded reference to Christ in inspired literature. Remember, this book may be older than Genesis. Job chapter 19 and verse 23, verse 27. Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Verse 24. That they were engraved on a rock with an iron pen and lead forever. Verse 25. For I know that my Redeemer lives. That's where we get that psalm. I know that my Redeemer lives. And He shall stand at last on the earth. The Redeemer there, if you notice in most translations, the R is capitalized. That means the translator is trying to get across the point that this is talking about deity. This is talking about a divine Redeemer. And Job is saying, I I wish this could be placed in a book written down, engraved on a rock, that I know there is his confidence that his Redeemer, the one who will redeem him, lives. And this Redeemer, he will stand at last on the earth. He's coming to earth. Verse 26, And after my skin is destroyed, this I know that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Now notice this. Job has already asked the question, Job 14 and verse 14, if a man dies, shall he live again? Now, by inspiration, it's being recorded here, that he knows that his Redeemer lives and will be on earth someday. And also, verse 26, after his skin is destroyed, that's talking about decomposition, talking about when he dies and is destroyed, he, his body decomposes. He says this I know in verse 26, that in my flesh I shall see God. How is that possible? Well, Romans chapter 3, verse 23 and 24 in the New Testament tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This would include Job. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we are all in need of a Redeemer. And verse 24 says, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. There is the Redeemer that Job spoke of. As he says, I know that my Redeemer lives and someday He will stand on the earth. It's referring to Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ not only gave us a promise, (coughs) excuse me, He not only gave us a promise of redemption from our sins so that we can be forgiven of our sins, but redemption of our physical body someday. John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, as Jesus was preaching a resurrection from the dead. He said, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in their graves will hear His voice. That includes Job. All that are in their graves will hear His voice and come forth, verse 29. Those that have done good to the resurrection of life and those that have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. And Job said in verse 26 of Job 19, after my flesh is destroyed, after I die and my body decays, I know that in my flesh I shall see God. He's referring to his own resurrection from the dead. 
He realized that one day his body would be re, or would be resurrected, even though it would undergo decay. Someday he would be resurrected, and in his body he would see God. Romans chapter eight and verse twenty-three. Romans chapter eight and verse twenty-three. We are presently, if we are Christians, we are in phase one of our redemption. We've been redeemed from our sins. If we're walking in the light, we're doing the will of the Lord, the blood of Christ has redeemed us, we are forgiven by the Redeemer. Phase two of our redemption will happen at the end of time in the resurrection. Look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 23. He says, not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption of the redemption of our body. He's writing to Christians who have already been redeemed from their sins. They've already been born again. Now they're looking for the redemption of their body. That's talking about the resurrection. The thing that Job was talking about in Job chapter 19. As he says, In my flesh I shall see God. But in his flesh that he's talking about there, we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it's not going to be the same body that was put into the ground when he died. Not going to be in the same body in the resurrection because of 1 Corinthians 15, verse 42 through 44. Paul says this, So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. Notice verse 44. 1 Corinthians 15, 44. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. The spiritual body is what Job was talking about in Job chapter 19 and verse 26. He says, even though my body decays, yet in my flesh I shall see God. He was going to receive a spiritual body, a resurrection from the dead. A body that is fit, conditioned to be with God for all eternity in heaven. Do you want to go to heaven in the body that you have now? And live in this body that you have now for all eternity? I don't. We're looking for a new body. If we remain faithful, we will be redeemed. Our body will be redeemed. And that body will see God and be with God for all eternity. That was the hope that Job had even in the midst of his suffering. He said, I know that my Redeemer lives. We now can look back on it as we read and study the Bible and we have the complete revelation of God that Job could not fully understand because he didn't have it. We can look back and know that our Redeemer lives. That He did stand upon the earth. That He did suffer and die upon the cross that He was buried, that on the third day He was resurrected from the dead, and that we too will be resurrected from the dead, so that we in our new spiritual body will see God and be with Him for all eternity. That's only for the faithful. That's only for the Christian. That's only for the one who has been redeemed in phase one of redemption. There's anyone here tonight who has not obeyed the gospel. You're going to be resurrected. Jesus talked about the wicked being resurrected. Those who are not saved, they will be resurrected. But it, be a, it will be a resurrection unto condemnation. Eternal punishment in hell. Christ came and died to save us from that. And as Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives. Believe in Christ. Confess Him as the Son of God. Repent of your sins and be baptized into Christ, immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and He will add you to His body, the church. If you've done that, you've gone astray. Come back to Him. Repent and confess your sins. As always, the choice is yours. While we stand and while we sing.